Hello, hello. My name is Gabriel Saeed Reynolds from the University of Notre Dame. Welcome to this episode of Exploring the Quran and the Bible. This is a really good one. I speak here with Professor Amran El Bedoui of the University of Houston, who was a scholar, um, really a masterful scholar of both late antiquity, the Syriac Christian tradition in late antiquity, but especially the way that that plays out in the Quran and the reception of the Quran in Islamic tradition. We speak about his various book projects, his first book project on the Quran and the Aramaic gospel traditions, his second on the communities of the Quran, looking at how all different segments and communities of Muslims engage with the Quran and his newest project, this is sort of a sneak preview of what he's up to now that has to do with female power and male prophecy in Arabia. So this is a really good one. I think you're gonna to wanna to like this video right now. Uh, so don't, don't forget to do that, that'll really help us out, but also subscribe to the channel, Exploring the Quran and the Bible. Well, hello, Professor Amran al Bedoui. Hello, Professor Reynolds, good to be with you today. <laughs> good to be with you too. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we, we have an episode to speak about your work uh, your groundbreaking work on the Quran, Quranic studies, which, uh, you know, in fact, transcends just Quranic studies uh, and addresses questions of late antiquity, Islamic origins, um, uh, the, the relationship between the, the Quran and the Bible, but also interesting questions about uh, gender, power, prophecy, uh, authority, uh, even sort of ecclesiology and rivalry between different uh, Christian communities at the time of Islam's origin. So I'm really looking forward to speaking with you. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm excited, you know, for what the future will bring. And uh, also, you know, a little bit nervous about sometimes where my research takes me, but uh, sure we'll have a good discussion. Yeah, we're grateful for all of your research. And I'm going to start just by sharing with our viewers um, a bit of your accolades and your work. So um, friends, um, Dr. Imran al Bedoui is program director an associate professor of Middle Eastern studies at the University of Houston, where he is also newly, I guess, right, the chair of modern and classical languages at Houston. I get that right? Correct. Okay. Yeah. God help you being a chair. It's not an easy, <laughs> not an easy job. It's My heart goes out to chairs, and I thank I thank God that I've avoided being a chair. So uh, God help you. Uh, uh, Dr. Bedoui founded the Arab Studies program at the University of Houston, and he has designed, implemented, and assessed degree programs in the humanities and sciences in all sorts of different uh, fields, Arab Middle Eastern studies, religious studies, interdisciplinary studies in energy development and sustainability with a focus on US Middle East relations. He's done all sorts of consulting for different industries, government law, oil and gas. Um, also really interesting cases where he's done advocacy work. Um, maybe there'll be a, mention, a time to mention that um, for um, different immigrants and uh, other organizations. Um, he's really had their back. Um, and been a force for the common good. Um, he also served, and this is something dear to my heart, as founding executive director and treasurer of the International Chronic Studies Association, or ICSA, which um, is the world's first learned society in Quranic studies of its kind. Um, and the work of ICSA is to do serious, critical academic work on the study of the Quran, but also to bridge the divide between scholars in the West and those in Muslim majority countries through a number of international conferences, which have taken place in all sorts of places, including uh, Tunisia and Morocco and elsewhere. Uh, there's more to say about his publications. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going on long, but it's your fault because you've done so much. <laughs> Professor Bedoui has published in both English and Arabic and has published both on sort of the really technical side of things. And we'll get into some of that, but hopefully make it pretty straightforward, but also in the popular press for the New York Times, Al Jazeera, Forbes, Christian Science Monitor, and the and Arte Television, a really major production. That's the Association Relative à la Télévision Européenne, um, a major documentary done on Quranic studies. Um, he's won a number of different awards for his book on the Quran and the Aramaic gospel traditions. And he works, as I mentioned briefly, on Middle Eastern Islamic civilization broadly, but especially late antique Arabia, Quran and Bible, Syriac churches and classical Islam. It's not um, everyone who can master both Syriac heritage and Islamic heritage um, and the Arabic language. Um, he started off though in computer science. So, which is probably a virtue with, with digital humanities that you can you know, make words, uh, uh, study different words and roots and um, make them do what you want them to. 
Um, and he received his PhD with honors in Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations from the University of Chicago. That's going to be, we're going to get back to that because that will be maybe our first question. Was Fred Donner your, your director there? Okay. Yes. Okay, great. Okay, and um, there's a long list of publications. I'll just mention um, his books. The first is uh, The Quran and Aramaic Gospel Traditions by Routledge Press in 2013, which is out in Arabic also, is that right? That's correct. Yes. So published as Al Quran al Karim wa Taqalid Kitabat al Bishara al Aramiya al Bishara. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So um, yeah, uh, and that's translated by Saleh Idris uh, by Dar al Nahda al Arabiya in 2020 has been published. So that's wonderful. Speaking about bridging um, different uh, scholarly communities. He edited with Paula Sanders, Communities of the Quran, Dialogue, Debate, and Diversity in the 21st Century with One World. I'll, we'll be speaking about that. And his current project, is it okay to mention the provisional title? Uh, or should it, we keep it a mystery? You no, know, you can mention it, it's fine. It's a, the, the, the title will change, so um, we'll, we'll have okay. to see. Okay, so let's say there's a current project around the topic of vanished queens, female power, and male prophecy in Arabia. Yeah. yeah. And I uh, yeah, keep stay tuned for that. We'll be speaking about it in our talk today. Um, but uh, Emran, if it's okay, I can just call you Emran. Is that all right? You call me. Uh, I, th I think that's fine. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So let's start with that uh, biographical question. Could you just you know briefly um, tell our viewers uh, how you entered into the field of Quranic studies? Thank you so much, Gabriel, if I may as well. And let me uh, thank you and also, uh, you know, uh, you know, everything you said, I, I want to say it's, it's not true, but uh, it, it, it is true. And much of that credit or, uh, you know, very uh, salient segments of my path and my trajectory are informed by, of course, a very near and dear colleague of mine who has helped influence me throughout my graduate studies. And of course, his name is Gabriel Reynolds. Right. Uh, and of course, you have been a partner in so many scholarly and uh, service endeavors, including uh, the International Quranic Studies Association. You know, uh, your body of scholarship has informed mine. I hope that I've returned that favor in small part. Uh, and so, you know, there, there are no words, you know, we could go on forever, but I just want to thank you and, and uh, tell you that I'm humbled and honored to really to really be with you this morning. So to get to your question. What is it that brought me to uh, Quranic studies? I mean, there are a couple of things, but I think really growing up as, uh, as a youth in uh, different Islamic societies, I was born in Malaysia and I was raised uh, mainly between Saudi Arabia and Egypt and uh, you know, enjoying those societies and learning the different languages and uh, also, being, also, sorry, also seeing different sort of flavors of, um, of Islamic culture and civilization that caused me to be curious and you know my father was ethnically south asian my mother is ethnically arab and you know again so this sort of uh, living sort of on the cusp or in the in the gap between two different cultures linguistically uh as well it really did impose upon me a level of i don't know what you want to call it, confusion broad-mindedness that may be a good kind of confusion. Good, well, I guess it's good now for sure. Yeah, I mean, now I look back, I think it's great. Uh, although there were there was some trauma, I would say, you know, uh, growing up. And long story short, my late father passed. He was a surgeon, but he also had a, a, a library, large and beautiful. I'm looking here at two libraries, right? Um, I'm liking yours more than mine. But uh, my late father's library was my sanctuary because I didn't get to know my father very well. And so, you know, he passed when I was about 11. And so I got to know him through, um, you know, unpublished works and published works of his. He would write mainly, you know, as a surgeon. He also wrote about the history of medicine and especially about medicine and Islamic civilization. And I have, you know, one quote actually in the beginning of, of my first book, The Quran and Aramaic Gospel Traditions uh, of that, you know, to that effect. But that began the process and within the library there were you know my father apparently read a lot about you know the bible and uh, about the quran and about you know middle eastern politics and uh, things of that nature that really piqued my interest and uh you know there's this almost a saying uh you know i don't know if it's called but in arabic I, I which escapes me now it's almost as though you know my father had left but he was raising me from the grave mm -hmm. and that really did pique my interest again, I wanted to learn about 
the Quran and the Bible and uh, an Islamic civilization from just within that library. I was not really too much bothered by the noise around me, you know, whatever in the 80s or in the 90s, whether it was, you know, this cleric or that, you know, priest or this, you know, political, you know, organization. And so for me, it was kind of natural. Um, I could see that when the Quran was speaking and articulating itself, it was referring back to uh, the Bible. And, you know, you know, I can mention also uh, by way of example, we have within Islamic tradition, ulum al-Quran, the, you know, Quranic sciences. And, you know, we have Zerkashi and other people who sort of, you know, coined this, this discipline, really. Right. And I also got interested and I started reading it. And of course, you know, it started listing, you know, what are the different kinds of Quranic science? The most basic one, which you will know, Gabriel, of course, is like Mecca and Madani, about which is lots of debate, right? There's the Quran that is sort of revealed in Mecca and that which is revealed in Medina, right? Uh, whatever that may have originally looked like. But, you know, what's the litmus test for knowing the Quran that is in a Meccan context versus in a Medinan context? This is within Islamic tradition. It's typically, you know, uh, phrases that uh, address a community. Ya ladina amanu, ya ahl al-kitab, you know, ladina uh, kafaru. When you start having, you know, when you start talking about a community, you're talking about um, not a different register, but, you know, certainly uh, a, an audience which is not necessarily one-to-one -one with the oracular apocalyptic, you know, statements in, you know, the Meccan surahs we find in, you know, in the 80s and 90s uh, of, you know, in, of, of the enumeration within the Quran today. So even just reading the Quran, the fact that it was re referring to Al-Ladina Amanu, again, in my mind, you know, now looking back, you know, I, it's referring to a believing community. Believing in what? You know, someone has faith, you know, uh, uh, Iman, Haimanutha, right, in Syriac. Uh, mm. You know, then again, at first, this sounds very Jewish and Christian. Um, and I'll just mention one, one thing, and then I can uh, come back to you, is also the, you know, the, there's the refrain of This is, of course, in Surah 11, Surah Yunus, I think so. So everywhere I went in the Quran, right, it talks about Ahl al-Kitab. Kitab is book, people of the book. And I think it was our friend, uh, our good friend and great scholar, uh, Devin Stewart, who delivered a paper one day, Ixa saying, why is it that we go in this circuitous way talking about people of the book, people of the Bible, right? What book are they referring to? They're not referring to the Iliad. They're not referring to, you know, some sort of other cookbook. It's the Bible. So people of the Bible. And uh, so for me, it was a no brainer that I had to study the Quran with the Bible, through the Bible, and that that was for me the tip of the spear of all Quranic studies. Mm -hmm. So if I can take you back before we leave your sort of development intellectually and personally um, uh, in your younger years, was it in the context, were, were there certain individuals um, who were studying sort of as a vocation, um, religious studies, Islamic studies, who influenced you? Um, if it's not too personal in, in your family or in your communities, was it well regarded to study religion or was it seen as maybe a less serious thing that, you know, people should be studying, I don't know, something more practical than religion? Um, did you have any, yeah, sort of uh, experiences in that regard? I would, uh, yeah, uh, thanks for the question because you're making me sort of, uh, you know, soul search uh, whilst we're talking and, uh, I would say the quick answer is we really didn't have anyone in, in our family, either on my Arab side or the Asian side, that was, you know, st studied uh, religion or religious texts uh, in, in this way. I mean, there was, of course, I had, you know, my, my I, had, I had an uncle who I never met. He was at the faculty of, um, I forget what it's called now, is it Semitic languages and so on, University of Cairo, which I've delivered a talk there before, and I got to visit that department finally. But, you know, he, he, he passed before I was even born. Okay. And then, of course, there was, uh, you know, on my father's side, there was actually my father who was just a, you know, very inquisitive, highly intelligent uh, person, very, you know, a broad array of interests. And that was really it. But for me to do what I have been doing all my life, I really was a bit of a rebel. I came from a, really, I came from a, a family of medical doctors and dentists and practitioners and I just didn't want to have anything to do with that world. So I, I this is my rebellion. 
There was was it something that happened when you were at at Rutgers as an undergrad that led you? Was it to Temple? Was that your first spot for stop for an it, MA so in religion? There's a one, two, three. The first step actually began in in Egypt in earnest. Uh, again, it was in my father's library, and then I realized that you know I'm going to have to do something about my interest in humanities and language and culture. And then uh, I did migrate to the to the U.S. Uh, in my you know late high school years. After finishing high school, I entered Rutgers University for my undergrad, and I did. I actually entered two parallel uh, paths. One, of course, you mentioned computer science, and the other one being religious studies. Um, and I just started basically getting deeper and deeper and deeper. Right? Uh, computer science was in case I wanted to work and pay the bills, in case the the other out, you know, other outfit, outfit didn't work out. And I worked actually in the industry for only a year, and it was not for me, you know. Uh, and uh, but it, uh, of course, it's very important, and it's the reason that we are able to progress. You know, even within the humanities today, you mentioned you know digital humanities, and it's something that, that has benefited me over the years. Uh, the the third stage of that is Temple University, where I did a master's uh, in religion as well, and I started getting serious. Um, yeah, so and I, I'm happy to elaborate. Um, yeah, let's elaborate. So, um, and then you went from Temple on to Chicago, and I wanted to ask generally just about. Um, um, mentors, maybe professors, or maybe books. Sometimes our best mentors are books. Um, were there certain books or individuals, either at Temple or at Chicago, who had a formative influence on your thinking? Uh, uh, oh boy, yes, absolutely. Uh, I mean, uh, it, it, I mean, I your question, I may, uh, I may appreciate it more of just you know having mentors and books just generally speaking. They were not necessarily in Temple or in Chicago, but by way of example, certainly when I was in Temple, Mahmoud Ayyub is just an right. encyclopedic, uh, uh, you know, uh, force impressive. on this earth. And he treads so lightly and is such a decent, lovely human being, you know, yes, gentle uh, and, and for, and I'm, I'm sure you, I'm sure you know him. He's, you know, how can anyone not know him? But when I, when I got to Temple, I didn't know him and I started studying under him and uh, he really did instruct me in the decorum of being a proper scholar and not being too hasty. I have a tendency to sometimes be a little bit too energetic and bounce off the walls. And he was like, Ooh, you know, so he shui, shui, as you say, he was, he, he let me borrow his books and he was just so generous in many ways. And of course his commentaries on the Quran are, I think, uh, terrific. He said something to me, Gabriel, I'm never going to forget. Because at that point, I was just a young and hungry grad student. And I was, you know, meddling with this thing called Syriac and, you know, modern Assyrian, modern Aramaic, Neo-Aramaic. I was just sort of self-teaching myself. And then uh, he said to me, he goes, Imran, you need to stick with this. I said, really? Why is that? He goes, because you're onto something. And that is the missing link between rabbinic tradition and the Quran are the Syriac churches. Mm. And he said it to me and immediately everything fell right into place. I had my ijazah from, you know, Mahmoud Ayyub. I was just in my mind thinking of an ijazah, right? Um, and I had so much respect for him and uh, the fact that he, he physically couldn't see, but with his heart and his mind could see so much more than any of us. Mm, and that he came from, from a storied, proud Shia background but was so respectful of Sunnis. And the fact that he respected me as this lowly, you know, kid in his class, I will never forget. And the debt that I owe him, you know, is, is incredible. Mm. Uh, other than that, you know, I have, I have, I have other mentors. Uh, uh, Fred Donner in, in, in Chicago remains, you know, really uh, more than a doctor father. You know, I feel like he's like a second father to me, you know, uh, he's, uh, and I know that you are good friends with him as well. We've traveled, him and I, we've traveled across the world. We've been at each other's functions. We know each other's families. We nourish each other's minds and souls with, with, with kind words. And I've learned a whole lot from him, you know? And, and, and is I, he working on, on the Quran? Uh, I, obviously, you know, he's written the book, Muhammad and the Believers, which has made a really big impact on the field. But of course, he started in uh, early Islamic history, working on the conquests and things like that. Um, Professor Donner, um, did he teach? Did he teach a seminar on the Quran? I, I remember he had an article on the 
the word Furqan. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. it's published in the journal of Semitic Studies. Yes, it is. Which in my mind is sort of his entry into Quranic studies when he started being interested in this difficult word in the Quran, Furqan. Yeah, so uh, did you speak about Quran or was it mostly history that he uh, was interested in at the time? Your assessment is correct, which is not surprising, right? Uh, when, I, when I came to Chicago in the early 2000s, you know, he was still a, a storied, you know, Islamic historian, well-respected. And that's why I was there, you know. And he did sort of pivot uh, along the same time that I was there looking at the article, of course, on Fur you know, Furqana in Syriac, which he, you know, he, his thesis was that might, there may be an overlap with Pukdana, which... Commandment, or is that yeah, right? Exa commandment? Exactly, exactly the command, right? Pukad. And, you know, again, people were sort of 50-50. A lot of people were not convinced some were. But again, it was, it was a captivating article and... Uh, I was happy to talk to him. I was in his office. We would talk about his articles. He's like, Emron, here, you know, I've written something. Go take a look at it. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe maybe I should just step back a second, I, although we don't want to focus really on this. We want to focus on you, but just to make sure there are not too many obscure references. So the Arabic word, and, and correct me if I get something wrong here, but the Quranic word Furqan is usually by the traditional exegetes and commentators understood to be something like the criterion, that which divides. That's from the Arabic root Fadaqa. But the form of the word seems to have something in common with the, with the typical Aramaic form, because it has that on ending, which is ana and, or ono in Aramaic. And in Aramaic, the root um, pa or fara, qaf, uh, has to do with redemption or salvation. And so there's an old argument that furqan is related to porqana in Syri Syriac or Aramaic. You know this better than I do, meaning... Um, something like redemption or salvation. So Yom al-Furqan would be the day of redemption. And then, as you said, Professor Donner uh, sort of flips that or takes it one step further and say, no, maybe there's actually um, a, a sort of uh, transformation that took place within the root. And so uh, it's actually related instead of Purkana to Pukhdana, so the Ra and the Da, which with the change of a dot in Syriac can uh, move from one to the other. Uh, anyway, so that's a little bit of background, just so there's not an obscure reference that people are no, watching and may not know Syria. Thank you for that clarification. And uh, yes, and this is probably my tendency to, of course, jump the gun. But uh, that clarification, of course, um, is is part of you know a larger picture where um, Fred and I, of course, did, were were developing in Quranic studies. You know, in right. maybe right. the same time, he of course was already a great scholar, and I was coming in as a grad student. Right. But um, he, his believers, his believers book was being written when I was there. I would walk okay. into his office because okay. he was working on it. Okay. And and we were excited about it. And I anyway, so that that book, of course, again, you know, his thesis again about having a confessional community where, where you know early Muslims included sort of Jews and Christians. Uh, I know that you and others, you know, might have different perspectives as well. I myself, you know, I one day I wake up I'm like, yes, this is exactly right. I wake up the next day, I'm like, well, maybe Something not. Else. So, but that's 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 a good piece of scholarship. So yes. yeah, and another important well, let's not life. let's not leave Syriac and Aramaic um uh, okay. yet. In fact, we'll be speaking a lot about it, I think. Uh and I just wanted to to comment, bring up the name, another name, Christoph Luxemburg now, because I, I imagine when you're working in Chicago as a PhD student and writing your book, uh, that must be in the background somewhere, right? Like, so the, the Christoph Luxemburg writes a book in German, the Zuro Aramaic Lazar des Quran, the Syro Aramaic reading of the Quran, which I think the original German comes out in the year 2000. Does that, is that about was, right? Yeah. I mean, it anyway, was someone will just Google it and prove, prove me wrong. I probably shouldn't guess at it. Uh, but it's somewhere around 2000. And, um, so, uh, I mean, was this in the background for you? Uh, do, do you want to like say anything about the impact of that book or the controversies or the rebuttals to it? And what, did, what sort of response did you have to um, the Luxembourg book? So there's a couple of things. I, we'd have to go even a little bit further back. So if you permit me, there's two, there's two things I want to say. First, my interest in Syriac is completely mutually exclusive from Luxembourg. Um, it began, again, in my earlier years um, with an intense curiosity, looking at the Quran and the Quran pointing back to the Bible and then asking myself and then studying, how is it that these Arabs, these sort of monotheistically minded Arabs had access to the Bible? Uh, there's, of course, a famous argument, uh, not argument, but it's, you know, an intellectual sort of argument between Arfan Shahid, the Byzantine, uh, uh, you know, historian. Uh, uh, and historian of pre-Islamic Arabia, and 
uh, Sidney Griffith, who of course works on Quran and, and Christian Arabic, uh, or Arab, yeah, anyway, so the argument, of course, uh, Fran Shahid posited that there might have been, you know, little bits and pieces of like an Arabic Bible, and uh, Sidney Griffith came back and sort of vociferously, uh, you know, negated that, that possibility, and over the years within academia, as you'll know, Gabriel, of course, uh, Griffith's uh, argument has sort of stood. There was no Arabic Bible, and we have no evidence of an Arabic Bible. Um, so what were Christian at, at, Arab the, at the time of Islam's origins, right? At the, at, in pre-Islamic Arabia, absolutely, yeah. right. Yeah. Obviously, well, later on, 8th, 9th century, it's translated into Arabic. But Right. Thank you again for the clarification. But again, in this world of late antiquity or pre-Islamic Arabia, the Jahiliya, right? You don't really have any Arabic books to begin with, right? That's something, you know, the first book we have is the Quran itself, which is so looks interesting. Leave, right? It's, you know, it's fascinating and it's problematic and all these things. But, you know, I come back to this point. The, those Arabs, the Christian Arabs, I would say mainly, access the Bible through Syriac. That's why Syriac was important to me. And because Syriac was important to the Arabs of pre-Islamic Arabia, I was going to study Syriac and I was going to get good at it and I was going to read all this stuff. And that's why I did it somewhere along the way. You know, uh, you know, Christoph Luxemburg writes this book, which I read in German. <laughs> it was really for me a trial by fire because it was not easy German either. There is, you know, um, there's also Gunther Luling. It's another thing that that German is impossible. I could not. I had to read the translation, but that's another story. Germans, of course, and Quranic studies, uh, they are, of course, the founders of the various classical and revisionist schools, and, and you can clarify, I'm sure, later on. But, uh, you know, I went through the, the trenches, and what I can say about Luxembourg was I benefited and enjoyed reading this book. I thought that what he was doing was bold, was groundbreaking, but it was also seriously, you know, um, arbitrary and flawed. The way he would change either, you know, the sort of orthography or the, you know, the skeleton of the, of the text seemed to me arbitrary because I know, I mean, I, I do the same thing. And I, when I study, I can change all sorts of things in the text and it would be, I would, I, I would come up with an amazing thesis about, you know, either a hidden church or a hidden Hanif somewhere in a cave. And so that to me was the problem. Uh, at the same time, though, I did, you know, I, I, I learned a lot from reading this book. And he had, there is some value in there. For example, the thesis of a, mi a mikshpacha, right? The sort of uh, a, a, an Arabic that is imbued with Aramaicisms. I think that has a little something we can talk about. Yeah. The examples- uh, Especially just, now, sorry to jump in, but yeah. I mean, if we, if we, we have a better sense of what uh, the pre-Islamic pre Nebataean um, civilization was like, and this is something you've worked on in your newest project, right? But my understanding is there, um, Aram Aramaic was used as a as a formal register, and a lot of the inscriptions are Aramaic. Um, but Arabic was probably the vernacular that was spoken every day. So these languages, at least in Nebataea, were probably. I mean, would you say that's right? We're coexisting. Yes, and even more so because uh, not only did did Arabs or whatever we want to call them, right? These you know tribal or you know state structures back in the time, did they have a register in Aramaic and a separate register in Arabic? They were bilingual, they were trilingual, right? Greek was extremely important. Um, and in some cases, even other languages, like, you know, if you go further back, even Latin or, uh, you know, in some cases, even Persian. But the, it, knowing Aramaic was, you know, just like knowing English today. It's the lingua franca. Mm -hmm. So he, he, the, thing about, the thing about Luxembourg is he didn't contextualize what he was doing properly. And he didn't cite enough examples from, uh, you know, from the scholarship. In later editions, he cites them more and it's a little bit better. But he got hammered, I think, really hard in the beginning because of just, you know, uh, he was bold and he went, he just, he just, again, like I said, some of it was arbitrary. And again, sifting through dictionaries, uh, merely sifting through dictionaries does not make uh, that strong an argument. Right. So right. anyway, that's right. what It's I'll interesting say. to know that your own sort of uh, journey, your path into Quranic studies, and that, and especially with that first book on the Aramaic gospel traditions, it's not a response to Luxembourg. Uh, now we see the background to your own story and how it develops. And the, that anecdote with Mahmoud Ayyub is really priceless because, uh, I mean, it rings true to me. And that's some of the, I mean, if I can flatter you a bit more for a second, I mean, that this one of the brilliant insights of your first book, The Quran and the Aramaic Gospel Traditions, is, um, you know, when we think of sort of 
biblical, especially New Testament language in the Quran. I don't know, the camel in the eye of the needle or the mustard seed or language about priests and Rukhban, monks. Um, you know, it, it, how much sense does it make to go back to your Greek New Testament when, I mean, Greek was around in the cities, yes, in late antiquity, but I mean, the real language of Christians in this region was, was Syriac, which is a form of Aramaic, right? So, um, I mean, you sort of like shook, shook up the whole field and, and, and helped us realize, no, you don't put your Arabic Quran next to your Greek New Testament. You, you need to read the Peshitta, the Syriac New Testament. Um, and not simply because Syriac is closer to Aramaic, linguistically speaking, but because there's a sort of realism about what the historical context was like. Anyway, maybe I'm reconstructing, I'm putting my own words into what was actually different, a different experience for you, but that's that's how I see the insight of the first book. Uh, thank you, that's very, that's too generous of you, Gabriel. I'm thinking of Muhammad Ali, I shook up the world, which I have, you know, but uh, uh, you, again, your compliments are too generous. And again, I uh, was very much in conversation with other scholars, yourself, with, you know, Dr. Griffith and others, you know, as I, as I was writing. But again, the source material, I think, is like you described, that for me, the, the default mode, if you wanted to look at what were pre-Islamic Arabs, uh, certainly within the, the, the Quranic context, what were they reading and you know, how were they talking? I think you have to go to Syriac or at least you know, the different Aramaic dialects. You know, so the, the, can I ask a specific question about, about the book or about the topic? Um, you know, there's some really great case studies you bring forward there, for example, on um, polemic against the clergy, which is strong in the, in the, in the Aramaic Gospels and also in the Quran. Um, uh, but I, I wanted to ask just, just generally about, about prophecy. This is just something that I find interesting, right, that um, the Quran has this very robust sense of the prophets in a clear sort of, I mean, it lists names of the prophets in a single verse, one after another, right? Um, uh, what, is the, what is the place of prophecy in the Syriac Gospels and maybe in Syriac, later Syriac tradition, if you wanted to touch on that? And how is it related to the Quran? So does that help us better understand why the category of prophet is so important to the Quran? Wow, that was a huge question. I'm gonna I'm gonna try and do my best, but uh, there are a couple of things. Um, you know, we could talk more about Syriac and the Quran specifically if you'd like. I'm happy to do that, and I'm gonna back up a little bit now and try and look at the subject of prophecy again. Um, there are many many threads and dimensions, right? Why is it that you know I have a chapter within my first book that looks at the prophets and what I've called their righteous entourage, right? Okay, and you know I'm looking, I'm thinking here again for you know. Um, Rasul wa Nabiyin, you know, wa Siddiqin, wa Shuhada, all these phrases right, get right. sort of paired with each other. Right. You have those in the gospel. So there's it's sort of there's already something shared. I would submit again if we look at the actual terminology, right? Nabi, wa Siddiqe, Sahde, all these you know, that there it's almost one to one with the Arabic. Right. Just to take them one by one, Nabi meaning prophets in Syriac. Zidike meaning the righteous ones. Exactly right. Yeah, and then like Zidikin, yeah. and then uh, the 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 so, martyrs so, was the last word. Sahde. Sahde, exactly. So you're catching them. Sahde is, is the martyrs, and then of course I can add Shlihe, which is the the Salihin. But we that's the word in Syriac for I think. Uh, oh my God, a apostles or apostle, right? I think so. Yes. Correct. Yes. So you know the Quran is using these you know uh, these coined, you know, sign, seal, and sense Syriac phrases, well known, they have a specific meaning. So, you know, this is to go back again to your question a little bit about Greek. I know I'm not answering your first question, but uh, I, again, it's, it's, it's the Syriac that it's taking from. And again, to get back to, to look at the condemnation of the clergy, you know, it says, Wailkun, you know, Sofre, Waprishe, Nasbai, Baope, right? Woe to you, Pharisees, priests, and hypocrites, something like that. I'm paraphrasing. And then in Arabic, uh, uh, what was it? Um, right? Woe, on the, you know, woe unto, uh, you know, the beliers on that day. This is, of course, I'm looking here at uh, is it Matthew 23 and uh, Quran 77. And those phrases are repeated over and over again. So you'll get part of it when you look at the Greek, but when you look at the Syriac and the Arabic, it's like, bam, right? It fits much closer. Anyway, about, about prophecy more broadly, Prophecy, 
is is more important in the late antique world and i would also submit within the syriac churches than has been appreciated thus far and when we get to when we talk about my next project that's what i was doing next mm -hmm. i was looking more at prophecy in the late in late antique arabia because that's where the Syriac fathers were sending missions. They were converting the Arabs, right? And the Arabs were on the receiving end of these Syriac missions. And all these holy men, they did not necessarily go by the title, hi, I'm prophet so-and-so, I serve God, right? They were, you know, uh, episcopal, or, you know, there was some sort of episcopal or sort of a, a bishop or an anchorite, you know, different names. But here's where the argument for prophecy comes in. Um, some of them, and I would argue many of them, there's, of course, a great book by Philip Wood looking at, uh, you know, just the development of, you know, Syriac, the Syriac church. It's just a fantastic book. This is the one on, I think we have no king but Christ. I forget the rest of it. It's about looking at the fifth century. It's a beautiful book looking at how um, the late antique Near East, which includes Arabia and that sort of no man's land between, you know, the Syriac speaking world and the Arabic speaking world, uh, was this wild west of spirituality and you had all these holy men inevitably men right uh that uh claimed all sorts of you know connection and authority uh from from god that's where the prophecy comes in right. and right. there are some there are some big names like jacob of Saru, who dies in 521 there's his 1500 year commemoration this year right across the world in, in universities in europe and in the middle east and and in america right uh, celebrating with Jacob of Sarug. Jacob of Sarug considered himself this sort of divinely inspired, um, what do they call him, the, the harp or the flute? Uh, yeah, I get mixed up. Ephraim is one and Jacob is the other. One is the harp and one is the flute. <laughs> exactly, exactly. One's the harp, one's the flute. Of, of he, the Holy Spirit. Of, of the Holy Spirit. Okay, thank you for the clarification. But he was musical. He was inspired by God. He was poetic. He was all the things that you would find and you know you know you, someone who would speak the quran but this is of course before it and he saw himself as like a second king david he saw himself as a prophetic figure that came after king david and he asked god let, you know let me be like him that's just one example and it's a it's a big example because it's jacob but there are other smaller ones i'll mention one small one it's it's in the the next project but uh paul of samosata of course who you know dies in the late third century was one of these wild west of spirituality characters you know um he came from this you know one of the er early semitic syriac church you know at that point it's very very early to, to distinguish one church from another and he too claimed some sort of angelic sort of inspiration and he you know he was in charge of a choir and you know and so all, i wanted to put all this together and in the next project but of course i stumbled upon something else which we can which we can talk about I speak about soon yeah so i i wanted to I, not get too theological but just a little bit theological gosh i i think in the uh, at the introduction to um this episode i mentioned that you participated in the arte project um which is really interesting. So did you, discussion. by the way. <laughs> yeah. You were, you were uh, there too. Yeah. So, yeah, very interesting, interesting project, um, mostly about Jesus in the Quran, but addressing other issues of Quranic studies. And I, they, they didn't ask me, but they asked some people at the end to say, okay, where does the Quran come from, basically? Does it come from God or from man, humanity? Um, so, uh, but I, I wanted to ask a less straightforward and sort of um, brash question and just to address that topic in a, in a more gentle way by asking about just thinking about the Quran in its historical context. Um, uh, I, do you think about how that relates to the claims of believers that the Quran's origin is not in history but is in um, in God, right? So um, uh, are there times where um, you feel like you have to justify the work you're doing to explain it, to sort of not only do the work, but sort of do the work of justifying the work by saying, no, this is legitimate. And th these are the, re the reasons or precepts behind historical critical research. Yeah. Could you comment on that whole topic generally? Wow. Yeah. Another, another big one. I'll, I'll try and, and, and give it my best. 
So I thank you again for mentioning the Artia project, which again, you're being extremely humble. You and other scholars have paved the way. You were there, and, uh, and I remember your presence very, very uh, potently. So, you know, looking at, you know, I think it was uh, some of our other colleagues, you know, that, that answered on, sort of on camera, uh, you know, your question. But two things. One, for me, again, in my original context, you know, sort of reading in my deceased father's library, I had no problem. There was no problem for me personally that the Quran is taken from the Bible or that the Bible is taken from Gilgamesh or that Gilgamesh is taken from, you know, that didn't, that didn't cause me any worries whatsoever. Um, and, you know, the, what the, the problem tended to be uh, the tradition and, uh, and theology, as you'll mention, and doctrine that was developed after the Quran, which didn't really concern me. I mean, it concerns me for sure. It concerns all of us, right? But uh, I realized that there is Quran, there is tafsir, there is the commentary, there is, you know, ulum al-Quran, which comes even later, there is hadith, which is, you know, a separate thing. These are all separate things. And the problem, of course, is you don't have this only within Islamic civilization. You have it certainly within Christianity, right? It's a tradition that's been a collection of traditions been around even longer, um, where you try and harmonize everything. So if we try to harmonize that, you know, the Quran is, you know, the word of God and that Hadith is the word of Muhammad and that the doctrine, you know, developed 200 years after the Quran, you know, is 100% is accurate, you're going to have problems. So for me, those problems came later. I was, I didn't have any problems. And this is the second part I want to tell you. When I go and I deliver, especially through ICSA, the great work that you as chair of uh, the International Chronic Study Association and uh, my humble role as an administrator, traveling the world and getting to meet amazing people, Muslims, Christians, Buddhists, you know, uh, Hindus, you know, atheists who are interested in Quran, either studying it or learning about it, you know, or teaching about it. Um, I'll never forget. There's one anecdote. There was a... A young lady, she was a student. She came up to me and she goes, this was in Tunisia. Okay. And she goes, Dr. El-Badawi, I noticed you when you deliver your talks, you have to sort of justify why you're delivering your talk. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, what are you talking about? She goes, I noticed that when, you know, your, uh, you know, European or American non-Muslim colleagues come and they deliver a talk. They just go right into it. They just say, you know, the Quran says this, Bible says this, and my method, da, 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 and that was it. And she goes, I like the second method better. So you don't need to justify anything. <laughs> so <Just> say it. <laughs> she said that to me, and, and it, again, it stuck with me. I'm like, why am I, why am I getting, you know, sort of bogged down with all these details? Um, if you'd like, I can also comment to make a third point about the sort of revelation question. Um, briefly, uh, within a minute. Yes, yes. So, you know, there, there are, of course, uh, scholarly studies on the subject of inzal, tanzil, and, you know, mm -hmm. the Quran, of course, talks about nazzalnahu alayka, you know, and, 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 and al ayat. You know, God is constantly revealing, descending, bringing down signs mm -hmm. and other things. Mm -hmm. um, but then, of course, there's this, there's this uh, uh, ayah, which is, وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لَوْلَا and you know, and those who reject, those who disbelieve, said, if only, right, um, the Quran or was it, yeah, the Quran was revealed, was descended, jumla wahida, one batch, one, one sitting, you know, in one recitation, right? Um, this is really important for my co-religionist and my colleague to not always consider. The speaker of the Quran, but also the interlocutor and the interlocutor who will never believe in the Quran. Why didn't they believe? One reason was that it came down piecemeal over years, that it was little bits and pieces of things coming. So if that's the case, that means that it has a history. That means that it has sort of, I won't say chronology, I don't want to get in trouble with you, right? But, uh, and I, but there's a sequence which we don't know yet, the chronology which is not pinned down, I would say, right? But it's not, you know, one and, you know, one and done. So again, compared to say the, the Jewish conception of the revelation of the Torah on Mount Sinai. Uh, well, perhaps that, and perhaps also maybe like, you know, there's all sorts of discussion. You know, Bart Ehrman talks about the letters of Paul and disputes all sorts of things, but at least segments of it, or maybe an entire letter, entire epistle has an author and was written at a certain time, right? So there's a certain sort of one and doneness to that. And I'm not a scholar of New Testament. 
uh, or, or, or Hebrew Bible or, or rabbinics. But, you know, that means that I have to study its, its history. I also know through, you know, Islamic tradition itself, um, you know, that according to Islamic tradition, Uthman compiled or, or you, know, you know, using, you know, a committee compiled the Quran. And that later on under Abdul Malik, there was some sort of process of editing. So just, if I look at just the Quran, then I look at Islamic tradition. And then I even just, you know, try and study as, you know, a critical scholar. All of those things tell me that I have to go back and study the history of the Quran because it does have a history. And because everything has history. Where one's, you know, soul, uh, you know, is nourished, I think is a separate question. Right. And for me, right. I do that. Right. Okay. That's really excellent. Well, I want to get onto your new project, but before we do, I don't want to skip over the communities of the Quran book because it's just an example that your work sort of transcends simply the question of Islamic origins and historical critical research. Although you know you're at the top of your game doing that sort of stuff, um, but this this was a really uh, important project that brought together. Well, I'll let you explain it, but Muslim Muslim scholars from different sorts of communities. Yeah, how did it come to be? Why did you do this sort of thing? Um, and what was the experience like working on that project? Thank you. So again, I, I'll go back to my experience with, uh, you know, one of my mentors, Mahmoud Ayyub, who I know I still have that energy and the bouncing off the wall. I, I have a lot of trouble focusing on one thing. So uh, uh, I do find my home, certainly in Quran, late antiquity and Quran and Bible, for sure. That's my home. Uh, but I'm constantly going out and doing other things. And one of them, of course, was I have a sense in my mind uh, or even in my ethos that scholarship is somehow related to service and I don't know how you feel maybe as an academic uh, you I, th I think that you know you are uh, you're a top-notch scholar Gabriel so you may want to stay away from service for me I actually I'm constantly looking at how you know uh, how can I use my scholarship to better understand the world today and maybe even have a small impact it may be foolish of me to think so but that's how I operate still so the community is a Quran project looked at um, you know, dialogue, debate, and diversity in the 21st century. And I was interested in a very different question, but related to, I was, you know, we, we've talked a little bit about the original audience, the Quran, or audiences. Well, what about modern audiences? What are communities around the world today, you know, who, you know, which are shaped by the Quran, what do they look like? Who are they? Who's in charge? What, what force does the Quran have today in the world? And I mean a positive force. We hear all day long about the politics and then the bad stuff. And I want to know human beings today who, 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 who find the Quran um, you know, a positive force in the world, who are they and what's their community? And it was fascinating because you certainly have various, you know, sort of Sunni Shia communities. Uh, who... Yeah, it wasn't just a question of getting a room full of Sunnis, half Sunnis, half Shias, and having them speak. Exactly. Uh, the vision of community was broader than that, I guess. It, we, exactly. And it was, it fronted gender and race. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and if, and if you read the book again, I know that you're, if you're familiar with it, you've, you've been with me all along, right? But, uh, you know, that in the beginning of the book, I'm interested in, we were, we're examining, you know, um, you know, through uh, Amina Beverly McLeod, she's looking at, um, you know, how is it that African American communities in Chicago engage with the Quran if they can't speak Arabic, and if they are sort of racially secluded from certain, you know, whether it's Arabs or white people. So it's fascinating questions, right? And through the Nation of Islam, again, we hear a lot of negative stuff, but how did they, you know, how do they plant roots using the Nation of Islam? And and uh, and then we look also, of course, in the book at. Um, you know, the Baha'i community, a global community here in Houston, they're thriving, uh, very sort of peace loving and sort of, you know, has everyone has a room at the table. Um, the Quran is a seminal part of their tradition as well. And, and, it, and, it, and it inspires further scriptures that they have. Uh, the LGBTQ community, again, right? Uh, it's uh, constantly evolving, but that chapter is the largest in the book. And it's one where I've done sort of readings of the book where I focus on that chapter. And it was very well received because it was powerful. Scott Kugel wrote that chapter and, you know, there, of course, people will agree and disagree inevitably, but, you know, it was so interesting and important to me to see that uh, the reach of the Quran is far beyond, you know, these communities of just text and these ancient, you know, commentaries, but it's also communities of experience and, you know, and, and communities of race and I would, you can push even further music and art and so on and so forth, but that would be like a part two. It raises the question of of the nature of community and authority 
um, which, you know, in some ways it's maybe easier to address this question in the Christian context, because there you have sort of denominational structures. I mean, especially in the Catholic Church, but also in the Orthodox and various Protestant churches, you know, you have a clear um, sort of architecture of leadership and channels of uh, of um, dissemination of doctrine and guidance and things like that. But with with Muslim communities, um, it, you know, things look different. It's not that there aren't similar architectures of leadership and channels for guidance, um, but uh, it, I, th I think the project helps us see that within Sunnism, so if we speak about, you know, by far the lar large majority of Muslims around the world, um, it's not just one block, right? You have all sorts of tendencies and cultural um, uh, phenomena or um, manifestations of belief within Sunnism, but then, you know, uh, different readings, different, um, different traditions. Um, so, uh, you know, seeing diversity within Sunnism, I think is, uh, is a real virtue of, of the book. Thank you. And um, I do feel, especially with this question, we have a, a it was a great uh, uh, chapter written by uh, and paper presented by Ingrid Madsen in that book for, uh, you know, on, I don't want to say on behalf of Sunnis. Again, it's just, you know, we're talking about over a billion people, right, that are just Sunni. And they're certainly not, a billion people are not all one thing, you know, and again, and my, my, my Catholic brothers and sisters is, you know, way over a billion, and they're all not one thing, even despite, despite the fact that they have some sort of unified clergy or, or leadership. Um, but again, we, uh, among, among the Sunnis, you know, it was, um, that's the one where I feel we just sort of scratched the surface, you know, we could always go back and do more. And, you know, there's plenty more room to, to do research really in this area. So, yeah. Well, okay. So um, uh, speaking of, um, of future research and uh, more room to do research, your, your latest project um, uh, brings up the whole question, brings us back to late antiquity, but brings up the whole question of um, of gender, power, prophecy, uh, which are some of the themes in the Communities of the Quran uh, project. But here, this is Emran al uh exploring a topic that is basically an undiscovered country in in uh, in Middle Eastern Islamic origins uh, research scholarship. Um, so, uh, I mean, it's really remarkable to see the three, the three books because there's such a diversity among them. And in this project, you've, um, you've really bridged, I mean, it's, as far as I understand, the manuscript is not um, just about um, looking at the Quran and understanding its subtext, but no, it's also about understanding the late antiquity and especially the Arabs and especially female figures among the Arabs in pre-Islamic Arabia. Um, so maybe we'll start with that part of the project. Could, could you speak to like why you got interested in that? I mean, why, why this interested in Ma, interest in Mavi or Zenobia or these, these figures that a lot of people won't have heard of? Right. Thank you again for the question. You know, I had hoped, of course, that, you know, by now or soon, you know, I, that we, 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 I have a book and we can talk about it. But, you know, COVID delayed me. So I'm going to blame it on, on the, the, the C word, which we don't have to talk about ever again. But anyway, um, the project itself, I have to say, on a deeply personal level, for me, when I'm writing, when I was writing this, um, and again, it may be one project or maybe two, maybe more, because it's so dense. Um, looking at female power in pre-Islamic Arabia, which I, for all intents and purposes, is you know, the same thing as late antique Arabia. I look at the, you know, anyway. So um, I, I'm writing just full blast. I am not minding one bit what anyone will say or what they'll think. I just, um, and there's a reason I did that. Um, I, there was a sense of impatience and urgency that I was writing this book because I, I was, again, uh, initially, I began uh, my journey on this next project looking at holy men in, in pre-Islamic Arabia. The Syriac churches were extremely important, looking at mentions of various, you know, prophets and prophetic figures, you know, uh, whether they're Greek speaking or, you know, Arabic speaking, I began on that journey. And then I started stumbling across, you know, kings and other people. And then I stumbled across queens. And in Arabic, they just call them Malikar, Malikat, or Muluk, or Mulk, you know, it uses this term for sovereign, sovereignty. A lot of these folks are female. And in some cases, they operated also, they, there was some interaction with holy men. And so the, the big examples, of course, are, uh, you know, at the Empress Zenobia, uh, Zenobia Augusta, right, who dies in 274, 275, and she's the empress of Palmyra and, you know, has this war with Rome, and 
And it's uh, just a, a, a no. silly anecdote. I, I hope it won't throw you off or Please. seem seem uh, inappropriate. But in in Lebanese Arabic, I don't know in Egyptian if it's the same. You know, if a young woman is well, someone wants to sort of throw shade at a young woman, like she thinks she's all that. <laughs> say something like. Shuhaidi, Zenobia, Haidi. Does she think of herself as Zenobia? So, like, there are echoes of that even in the in the colloquial Arabic today. And I thought I'd just throw that in there. Oh, I'm I'm glad you mentioned that. I I I didn't know that, but now now I've. But it makes perfect sense. Uh, I won't say anything about Arab women because I'm going to get in trouble. But let's just <laughs> so. But uh, and not only that, Gabriel, you're talking about echoes now, maybe even the 21st century. One thing I argue in the book is that Zenobia through various subliminal channels, right? One argument I make uh, in the book is that when Quran 27, Surah An-Nami, okay, with the exchange between King Solomon and yes. the Queen of Sheba, right? Queen and this doesn't, doesn't give her name, right? right? Uh, as you'll, you'll know, I think you're familiar with some of you know, the, the work that I'm working on right now. I argue that that's actually a, the way that the exchange takes place is a recollection of Zenobia and Emperor Aurelian, right? Um, the Roman emperor and the sort of the exchange of words and the rejection of the gifts and the attack and the so on. Um, because Zenobia's example and her imprint in what we could call even, even uh, Arab history, right? Or, or pre-Islamic uh, Arabian tradition is very, very strong but it's subtle. And that's why I wrote the book, because you can't see it. Right? It's, not, it's not like it says Queen Zenobia inspired this. You have to really read between the lines. There are many, many other examples. Here's another small one, right? So you have um, within Quraysh, within the Arabic sources, the name Zainab. Zainab is within Muhammad's household. You have Zainab bint Jahsh, one of his wives. And there's some good research done by, some great research done by um, David Powers. He, of course, works on uh, Zaid, Zaid Ibn Haritha, of course. Uh, we can talk about it later. But, you know, his sort of, his ex, and I'm saying not even ex-wife, but literally his ex is Zainab bint Jash. And that's Muhammad's, the prophet's next. So <laughs> this love triangle is also an important part of the book. You know, I'm, I'm giving you sort of just, you know, little spits and spats of, of the book itself. <laughs> Um, and it's not very systematic, but that name Zainab is also some sort of derivation of Zenobia. And it's a memory of a noblewoman. Why else would I name my daughter Zenobia, right? It's because it's a good name. It's because it's a name that came from an Arabian queen who we all sort of, you know, respect and admire and so on and so forth. So the female figure who is valued and commemorated by... Okay this name Zainab, which has echoes of the name Zenubia, and you can hear the, the Zain, the Noon, and the Ba in there. Um, it shows that uh, women who were valued, even in the context of Mecca, were not, um, were powerful women. I mean, if Zenubia is, is remembered or cherished in this way. Uh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I was just gonna uh, go back to the Queen of Sheba and just make sure we clarify this in case viewers aren't, aren't familiar with the story. So, um, I mean, the Quranic presentation of the Queen of Sheba, who of course appears also in the historical books of the Old Testaments, and then there are various later works um, within Jewish and Christian tradition, which expand the sort of legend of the Queen of Sheba. Um, but in the Quran, she is sort of, um, uh, well, how do you put this appropriately? I mean, she, she represents a sort of um, unbelief and, um, uh, her response to the story, the her response to the uh, the overtures or advances that um, Solomon makes, not in a romantic way, but in terms of um, inviting her to submit to God and to His authority, um, r represent uh, uh, in some ways what could be a challenging story because ultimately she's she is vanquished by Solomon and. Um, I, I just wonder how you interpret in the context of your project. I mean, th is the Quran mean mean to sort of uh, make the Queen of Sheba an, an example not to be imitated of a problematic woman who is inappropriately leading her people to unbelief and maybe as a woman shouldn't be leading people at all? Um, 
uh, is this a story about male power and the triumph of male power? Um, it's, it, does it run sort of against the, the vision that you develop regarding powerful women like Zinubio? Yeah, what would be your thoughts on that? Okay, so uh, the answer would be a, also a bit of a patchwork, like the question, because um, the Quran clearly reinforces the position of the Bible, right? Which is that Solomon believes in the one God, conquers, you know, Sheba, Saudi Arabia, whatever it is, and conquers their queen, their pagan queen, worships the sun, moon, and stars, right? Um, and it clearly, you know, good triumphs over, over idolatry, right? And that, you know, she's converted. And, um, so in one sense, the Quran is clearly um, reinforcing and promoting a, a very sort of patriarchal notion of power. It is definitely unbridled male power. But again, within the Quran, there are subtleties, right? Um, the speaker, which you may argue, it may be even the queen in, in Surah 27, very famous saying, after the Arab Spring, everyone was saying, right? Inna al-muluka idha dakhalu al-art afsaduha. Mm. And indeed, right, if kings enter the land, they utterly ravage it, right? And again, there are all sorts of things you can think about the jahiliya, you could think about, um, you know, Pharaoh, you could think about, but um, there's a realization, even in the Quran itself, that male power is destructive mm. and, and that King Solomon went too far. There's, mm. there's also this man, the thing is that's really interesting. I mean, the, that, yeah, it, there's a sort absolutely. of note of hesitation or yes. regret almost with the triumph. And the thing about the, the Quran, it's it's very, very subtle, but it, it demonstrates that yes, we this is about male power and you know men are in charge. But again, the men who have been here before have done a pretty bad job. And again, the same thing with the word Khalifa, right? Uh, or Khilafa, right? That uh, it, the, it, this is, it's associated with King David after he's like, you know, sinned. And, you know, there's the example, of course, uh, in the Bible when Nathan corrects David or actually admonishes him because he basically killed Uriah and took, you know, Bathsheba as his wife, which again relates to both Zeno the, the telling of the story of Zenobia and the Queen of Sheba. These three stories are connected. Um, so it, even, even in that story, the Quran is admonishing, you know, King David. And I think it's, it's, I know you work on the prophets in, in the Quran and you've published so much material, but you or other colleagues have also articulated, you know, how the Quran is, it's not, it's not like Islamic tradition or certainly Islamic doctrine where the prophets are perfect and never make mistakes. They make mistakes in the Quran and God tells them, hey, don't do this. Or, you know, you, you made a mistake over here. Um, later, Islamic tradition tries to smooth that over, which is where some of the problems we're talking about come from. But if we back up again and we talk about the Queen of Sheba, um, it is about male power. There is, I think, a, a reticence and a reluctance uh, about it. Um, but then later traditions, of course, go much, much further. And that's again where our, this is where our imagination and memory come from. It doesn't really come from necessarily from the Quran really or the Bible. It comes from, you know, commentaries later on and various traditions and nationally, you know, the, the Kebran August, which is of course the, the Ethiopic, uh, you know, sort of book of national heritage and, and, uh, and it, you know, it celebrates uh, the, the powerful Queen Makeda, who was, you know, equated to the Queen of Sheba. Mm -hmm. But then there are other traditions which really make her nothing more than just a maidservant or a handservant of, of, of King Solomon. And of course, within, you know, these European, you know, uh, post-Renaissance paintings, uh, the, the Queen of Sheba is sort of this trophy that's given to King Solomon. All that is, is developed later. It's beautiful, it's nice, it's great, but it's, you know, it all reinforces male power in a way that far exceeds pre-Islamic Arabia developed. or the Quran. Yeah, so it's just yeah. really developed. Okay. That's great. Well, I, we've, um, we've uh, exhausted um, maybe our time and uh, taken advantage of your generosity by asking you about all, all three projects. But before we go, I want to exhaust you a little bit more <laughs> and ask you if, if you um, could reflect basically sort of in a retrospective way about your, your work in the field of Quranic studies. Um, this is a, is a complicated field. It's a very exciting field, lots of research still to be done. And you're you know, one of the pioneers in different subfields within Quranic studies. Um, I don't know, would you like to reflect on uh, the nature of the field of Quranic studies, your experiences, um, what are some of the challenges, what are some of its promises, um, what are the, some of the, maybe the obstacles you've overcome personally, any general reflections like that? 
Thank you, Gabriel. Thank you again for a terrific interview and uh, not exhausting whatsoever. It was just getting good, just getting, just getting warmed up. Um, that's, that's a sign of, a, I think, a, a skilled interviewer and uh, you know, man managed to keep a captive uh, audience. I will say, you know, Quranic studies has, whether you want, you know, whatever mark you want to look at 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, want to go back to the days of Abraham Geiger, you know, over 100, 200 years ago, um, you know, their progress has been made. It's more exciting. It's more, it's more scholarly rigor. It's more rigorous scholarly. It's, it's better all around. Uh, so all of that I take for granted. Yes, there is, we're moving in a direction that I would describe as progress because of all of us, because of you, because of my very humble contributions, because of others. Um, I would say even my work with ICSA, which is my work with you and with uh, other colleagues, uh, has, I think it has brought some good to, to academia and to this world. Uh, namely, you know, what, what I really want to say is not actually that intellectual or scholarly. It has to do with just, you you said it, and it's a quote that I take from you that, you know, ICSA and Quranic studies really is a community of scholars and friends. You and I believe that with every fiber of our being. Some of our colleagues need a little bit more time to come on board, and I think that they more or less did. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's the mantra is, you know, let everyone have a seat at the table, be open, be friendly, be kind, and uh, to sort of connect the dots real quickly, if I have another minute, you know, my book was reviewed several times, generally good, but, you know, there was one review which hurt a little bit, it was from a senior colleague, and I met the senior colleague later on after he said some relatively harsh things about the book, which I, I did not see, I did not, that's not that I didn't accept it, it's because I think he misread, you know, many, many large pieces of, of what I was doing, and when I, I walked right up to him, and he asked me, he says, are we still talking? And then we had a good laugh. I said, of course we're talking. I said, what we do, we, we have nobody but each other. We're a small community spread over the world. We have to be kind. We have to be generous. Uh, Gabriel, you're, uh, you're, an, you're an exemplar. And if we all do that, I think that Quranic studies will continue to, to, to develop and grow. I'll say a couple of other things in terms of, you know, conferences. The impact of, of what we've done, Gabriel, and others, uh, you know, uh, to conferences, the job market, pre-COVID, of course, um, the incorporation of Syriac, late antiquity, computational methods, carbon dating, you know, many other colleagues have worked on stuff. This is now common Not parlance understood. when we talk about Quranic studies. So we've made, I think, a lot of progress. And I think all we need to do moving forward is just continue to be kind with each other and, and get together and, and celebrate each other's work. And be good. That's really, really beautiful. And um, maybe we should end there, but I can't resist one, one last question. Go ahead, go for <laughs> it. Related to it. <laughs> I sometimes hear the concern that people working in chronic studies um, self-censor, that um, it's such a difficult, complicated field that um, uh, people are hesitant to be really cutting edge. Um, and there's been some debates out there, some of them relatively public between different scholars about the nature of Quranic studies, maybe Islamic studies more generally, and to what extent it is um, uh, affected by concerns with interreligious dialogue and building, um, you know, some of these uh, bridges that will allow different communities to respect each other, and whether that has like overshadowed and overtaken historical critical research. So do you think that's an issue? Is there self-censorship going on? Is the field not cutting edge enough? Um, what would you say to that? No, I think, I think Gabriel, I think yes and no. I mean, in, in popular circles or just in the general public, do people self-censor? Yes, but I think a little bit less so than before, okay. right? I mean, social media has really smashed all sorts of doors that used to be closed before. Now that's both good and bad, but so one thing is social media has mitigated that problem that you just described, which is real, but I think it's a little bit less. I think within academia, also less so, um, that some people will self-censor, that's true. Uh, I think also some of this happens in, in other areas as well. Quranic studies is sort of front and center because it's really important and exciting and you know we're always in the Middle East, something's always happening. But I've tried to tackle this myself because your, your question obviously is real and the answer is yes. So I have you know an article that I published a couple of years ago um, in Arabic 
الحريه الفكريه والدراسات القرانيه right so intellectual freedom and the study of the quran uh, which was translated into i think five or six different languages wow. and and appeared i think also in the newspapers in in italy i think i sent it to you i'm not sure but that was a couple of years ago and you know it's the, things develop and now there's all sorts of people out there you know there's uh, i don't have to mention names there are all sorts of popularizers of our scholarship in the arabic speaking world and other parts of you know uh, muslim majority countries they take our i hear our names i hear your name gabriel and i hear some of my colleagues names not so infrequently in uh, you know on tv programs you were just recently i know uh with um oh my god what's his ibrahim, name ibrahim isa ibrahim isa right a well respected uh, uh media personality in egypt so good good for you gabriel and well done for i think uh, the field of quranic studies so all of this mitigates the the sort of self censorship that we were you know suffering before and one last thing of course is the current project i'm doing right now is not self censored whatsoever it's so raw and unbridled i i almost cringe when i feel you know i'm going to send this to a publisher one day uh, but so i think we've made progress there as well gabriel you've been part of that and and other people beyond you know the, the phd's and universities they're also taking you know that sort of message uh uh, you know, to the public. That was a really great answer, right? It's been terrific. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Imran al Badawi. Uh, keep, keep, keep on, um, keep on working hard and and being a groundbreaking scholar. And thank you for being with me today. And thank you for your friendship. I'm humbled. Thank you so much to you, Professor Gabriel Reynolds. Um, you know, looking forward to the next time we see each other. Okay, sounds good. Take care. Perfect. Well, friends, thanks for being with us for this episode of Exploring the Quran and the Bible. I hope you found it to be an edifying discussion. I really hope that you find generally the, um, the content on this channel to be useful. There's a really diverse range of things um, reg in regard to Quranic studies and biblical studies with top-notch scholars. And um, we'll be really grateful for your support. So please don't hesitate to like the videos starting with this one maybe, to subscribe to the channel and to share the news with your friends about exploring the Quran and the Bible.